Perfect. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about two projects, actually. I'm going to talk about this ultra-low-cost MRI, something I've worked on for the better part of a decade, both at Stanford and now at Berkeley. And I'm also going to talk about a new project that I think has a huge potential to um, being perhaps the dominant imaging modality for tracking stem cells in vivo, especially in small animals. So the two um, um, glimpses of projects, the first one is pre-polarized MRI. And here, the primary goal was to get a tenfold reduction in the cost of a scanner. You probably all are aware that a, a state-of-the-art 1.5T MRI scanner costs on the order of $1.5 million dollars and there's uh, a lot of effort to go to higher and higher field strengths. The costs go up quite dramatically. Um, the cost of a 7T whole body MRI scanner is upwards of uh, 10 million and above. And so one of the things that you see as a result of this is that almost all MRI scanners are in Europe, uh, North America, and in Japan. And it would be great to have uh, the possibility of a high quality MRI scanner for the third world. And in, and in particular, the, the uh, architecture we've developed over the last decade does not require cryogens or superconducting magnets, and, but we can still actually get high-quality uh, images. So we think it would be very suitable for the developing world. Um, people may not be aware of this, but just like the gas shortage, there's a huge shortage on helium. Um, there's about a seven-year supply in the U.S. for helium. And so this could be a very significant concern for MRI as it goes forward. Um, in, in this um, country, the radiologists are very excited because we get two order of magnitude image improvement near metal implants. There's about 20 million Americans who have metal either in their spine from a back pain surgery or in, in their knees if, if they have a total knee replacement. And right now you can't do either CT or MRI adjacent to those metal implants. And our scanner can make images right next to those metal implants. Um, as I move forward at Berkeley, what I'd love to do is try to use the fact that we know how to make a very low-cost scanner um, and move into areas where the cost of MRI is simply prohibitive, areas where ultrasound tends to dominate. Um, everyone knows type 2 diabetes is becoming an epidemic in the U.S. Um, and actually in the entire world. And so one of the, the, the important uses of a low-cost MRI scanner is to diagnose problems of the diabetic foot. In addition, breast cancer is, is a very good application for getting something down to the cost of x-ray mammography. And finally, I'd, I'd like to look into obesity applications, because currently there is no 3D method for getting body fat distribution. The other project is this magnetic particle imaging scanner. Currently, MRI is used very often to try to track stem cells through the body of typically a, a small animal like a, a rodent. And it's also very useful for tracking inflammation in the body. Sort of the grand theory of medicine right now is inflammation leads to almost all illnesses. And right now there is no good general way to track inflammation throughout a live animal. Um, a lot of the methods in biology involve optical techniques and they simply won't penetrate through uh, tens of centimeters or even a few centimeters of tissue. So what we're developing is a tabletop inexpensive push button operation scanner on the order of $5,000. And here's the really kicker. It's about 200 to 1,000 times more sensitive than MRI. And that's because we're using the same magnetic labels that we use in MRI. They're called SPIOs. But we're actually de directly detecting the magnetization from those tags. Let's see if this works. Ah, good. So without going into any of the details, we actually have a very different architecture for this MRI scanner. It's shown on the left. This is our third generation knee scanner. And we use two magnets instead of one. Normally in MRI, you have one 1.5 Tesla magnet. It has to be incredibly homogeneous and incredibly strong. Instead, we have one magnet that's strong and one magnet that's homogeneous. And we do them in sequence. Turn one on, turn another one on. And you can barely make it out here. The strong magnets on the inside and the homogeneous magnets on the outside. If you do this all perfectly, you work out all the electronics, you can actually get pretty good image quality. Let's see if this will... And this is a knee scan. This is absolutely the first knee scan we did. You can make out all the meniscus, and I'm just panning through the slices. The bottom line here is the total cost of the scanner was about $60,000. It's about 10% of the cost of an equivalent 1.5T scanner. 
and it is equivalent in resolution and scan time. So when we, have to, when we compare these to 1.5T, it's a little unfair because we only have a 0.5 Tesla polarization. If we do everything correct, we're going to suffer a factor of 3 loss in signal to noise. However, if you look at these side-by-side -side comparisons of normal wrists um, and normal knees, here you can actually make out the factor of 3 loss in SNR, but you can see very good anatomy. You can actually make out um, the cartilage here in the knee, which is the normal ski injury. And I wanted to point out this other one here. We had a normal volunteer who had fallen off her bicycle. She had shattered her forearms. And in the reconstruction, they had used metal. This is a stainless steel plate and four um, titanium screws that would hold the bone together while it grows back. And this is not an exaggerated image. This is the 1.5 T scan of that. And you can actually see a huge blowout in the image. That's due to the magnetic effects of that metal. It's not very magnetic. It's totally non-magnetic. But MRI is just super sensitive. If you have more than a part per million deviation in the field, you can't make an image. Since we're down at a much lower field strength when we image, we're, we get two orders of magnitude improvement there. The other project I wanted to um, let people know that I'm starting to work on and, and talk about collaborations is something called magnetic particle imaging. Um, there's only one group in the world currently working on this at Philips. They have a wonderful paper from Nature two years ago. Um, the, the, the reason I'm excited about it is 200-fold increase in SNR because we're directly detecting the magnetic tags um, inside the body of the animal. Normally, you're actually detecting a slight um, effect on the MRI scan of those particles. Um, this is the first 2D image here. You can see it's a little bit primitive. Um, basically, they, they rastered a, a sample um, with the robot positions, and they just detected it. I won't go into too many details. Suffice to say that what we're looking for is the nonlinearities of that magnetic material. It does saturate. So if you put in a single tone at, say, 100 kilohertz, anything that comes back out at 300 kilohertz came from a nonlinear material. Fortunately, we're totally diamagnetic as our mice, and so there's no nonlinearities from the mouse. And so anything that comes back at third, fifth, seventh harmonic has to be from the magnetic material. And what they came up with was a really brilliant idea using a very strong magnetic field gradient, somewhat like MRI but very different, to localize when, when you're actually looking for those harmonics. And that's how we, they were able to make this image. So we've been looking at this very recently. Uh, the last year we've built all of the hardware to do our first tests, and we think we can actually get significant, uh, probably factor of 10 improvement in signal-to-noise ratio over the original experiment. And I think it's going to be ideal for stem cell tracking in vivo or for catheter tracking, anything where you can put these small magnetic particles on there. And I should mention, if I didn't already, that these magnetic particles are FDA approved for humans already. So there's no safety or toxicity issues whatsoever. Um, when you don't have images, you show hardware first. And so, so here's some of the components that we've been putting together. Um, this is kind of cool. This is our, our magnetic field gradient. Um, this is two orders of magnitude stronger than any of the MRI field gradients because we used a permanent magnet. This is a, um, this is a coil here, and this is an opposed coil out over here. You can't see it, but we can get a four Tesla per meter gradient, and that's sort of what you need to do, but it only costs about uh, $200. And then here's our excitation coil, which presents that 100 kilohertz stimulus, and then there's a receiver coil in there you can't see that picks up that 300 kilohertz response. And so here's our first data. It's just 1D at this current moment. Um, if you go through all the uh, magnetization mathematics, you can actually get a response. This would be your sort of your impulse response, if you will. And uh, our measured full width half max is a little bit better than theory, so that, that calls into question some things. But you can see that we're actually getting pretty good sensitivity already. And, and so w what you have to do is actually mechanically scan through the mouse or you have to move the center of that gradient to get your 3D scan. So what are the opportunities here for collaboration? So I've talked about two projects at a very high level. Um, first is this inexpensive pre-polarized MRI. And I think that one of the most exciting applications is in the developing world, um, India and China. Again, taking into account the fact that liquid helium is, is in very short supply. I think in this country, there's a lot of interest in getting much better MRI near metal implants. Um, there are really tens of millions of patients in the U.S. with metal implants. And right now, 
because you can't really get a good image with CT and you can't get any image at all with MRI, they're actually imaged with projection X-ray, even though people know that they're not going to get any good soft tissue contrast from a projection X-ray, but that's standard of care. One thing I'm very excited about working on now, I've been talking with the School of Public Health at Berkeley, and body composition analysis, I think, is a huge opportunity for a very low-cost MRI scanner. Currently, the people in body composition analysis, basically people who study, um, let me go back, um, obesity and diabetes and all the sequelae from o the American lifestyle, they actually use what's called dual energy x-ray, and it's a projection format. So there's no way to distinguish fat just under the skin, subcutaneous fat, from um, visceral fat. And there's a lot of studies that have shown that visceral fat is a much better predictor of heart disease and obesity and diabetes than is subcutaneous fat. So the current standard actually doesn't measure the most important thing that's out there. If we had a 3D MRI study, we could actually do that. We could get at that um, distinguishing between the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat. So that's one of the things I'd really like to get into, um, probably working mostly with the School of Public Health as well as with UCSF. Another thing, Dorian Liepman here um, works in uh, diabetes monitoring. One of the, one of the big um, important medical sequelae in late stage diabetes is that you, you get very poor vascularization of your feet and a significant fraction of uh, diabetics eventually do have to have their foot amputated. And MRI is the preferred modality now for imaging the foot and finding out how the infections in gangrene are setting in and to see whether or not you can, you can treat this with antibiotics um, or if you have to go to surgery. Um, and right now, it, it's still not done that much, and I think part of the problem is cost. So having a dedicated foot scanner, something we've already built, could actually be a very big deal. And um, this isn't just an American problem where there's 7% of Americans now have type 2 diabetes. In India, there's one city that 17% of the, po of the adult population in that one city, Chennai, actually has type 2 diabetes. It's a, it's a huge problem, and it's the same is, things are happening in China as well. The last project, I really just presented a glimpse. I wanted to let people know here that I'm starting a, a, a new hardware project in magnetic particle imaging. Since these particles are FDA approved, we could actually think about doing human angiography with it. Um, but near term, we're going to be focusing on stem cell tracking and perhaps tracking of devices in the, in the human body. And, and the very enticing part is this very large increase in signal-to-noise ratio relative to MRI. And with that, I will conclude my talk and see if there are any questions. Sure. for my surgery, and um, what I end up doing invariably is uh, called a CT myelogram. Uh, CT with radiation myelogram just to visualize the uh, spinal cord and nerve root. Um, so I'm very interested in uh, what you were talking about in terms of, uh, you know, not having or very minimal artifact. Uh, uh, have you tried it on, on, I'm sorry? Would you prefer the MRI? I, I would. I mean, not just so much the uh, uh, the issue regarding visualization of nerve without having to introduce a, a diet which will require a spinal tap uh, on the part of a radiologist, but also radiation, uh, you know, concern. Uh, and, and a lot of my patients would end up getting multiple um, CTs during their lifetime, and, and that is a you know, big concern. So uh, have you done anything specifically for spine uh, in terms well, of? Fine, you just couldn't look at the whole person. That's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Hey, Steve. I yes. Had one, I had one more. I had one question for you, just which is the one you tried to avoid during your talk. Yes. It's really, it's really rare to get better performance than a simulation. Than a simulation where you're ignoring stuff. You have any idea what's going on there? Yeah, the simulation was wrong. <laughs> but usually, you're forgetting. You're usually reducing the physics in the simulation, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's no way you you can do better than the simulation. So. Um, you're just not sure what's going on. Not not yet. No, that, that was a little bit older, but we'll get it. I know. I'm just curious. Yeah. Anything else? Good.